uh, Dr. Charles Mosley, who has others who will present, and he will introduce them. Uh, Dr. Mosley. Thanks very much. Can you hear me okay, everyone? Yep. I'm going to provide you with a uh, brief overview of the consent decree, but before I do, I thought it might be really helpful to ask Tony Antosh to give a, a, a synopsis, kind of an overview of the background um, of the consent decree and, and uh, the, the sort of changes that have taken place in services and supports that are furnished to individuals with intellectual and developmental disabilities, both in Rhode Island and nationwide. So, Tony, do you want to come up and kind of start with a, a general, and then I'll step in to uh, discuss how the uh, consent decree really fits in with this broader context? Thank you, Charles. Thank you, Charles. The, uh Thank you for the opportunity. My IT person, Donna, is here, who's going to hit, and so I typically flip through things relatively quick. When um, Dr. Mosley and I sort of talked about what he wanted me to do, we sort of focused on three things. One is that um, I, who have lived in Rhode Island for a very long time, 50 years, and been part of the developmental disability movement for 48, uh, Dr. Mosley thought it would be good for me to give sort of a little bit of a history, and I'm, there's much more on my slides that I'm going to say, uh, but it will give a sense of sort of how this system has evolved over the last 50, 60, 70 years. Then I'm also responsible for what in the consent decree is known as the Conversion Institute. So Dr. Mosley wanted me to talk about that very briefly, and then I'm going to highlight just briefly some needs statements that we have made um, and give you just a little bit of trend data um, to document kind of where we have come from and where we are and kind of where we're moving. So that's my agenda. Those are those three things. Um, you know, being um, historical, at some level you have to go back to the early 1900s, um, and that was really the era of institutions. I, the next five or six slides I set up with uh, the national perspective on the left side and the Rhode Island perspective on the right side. Um, throughout maybe the first 60, 70 years of this century, the only options that families had were either to do an institutional placement or to be at home with really no um, service. The Rhode Island version of that was Lat School, which was founded as the, uh, the Rhode Island School for the Feeble-Minded in 1907. And over the course of the next 87 years, 4,533 people lived there. Um, and at, at its max, the population was about 1,100 in the late 60s, early 70s. I was a direct support worker in Lat School's institutional back wards in the late 60s and late 70s. What really changed that whole dynamic was the growth of a parent movement nationwide. Uh, nationally, what, what we all know as the ARC movement started in Cuyahoga County, Ohio in 1933. Here it really began in about 1951. There were a group of parents that used to meet at the old Providence Gas House, referred to themselves as the Gas House Gang. Um, and fundamentally what they did was that they advocated for something meaningful for their family members to do every day. A really significant story is that one of the centers is named after Arthur Trudeau, who knew Congressman John Fogarty, and got him involved in the movement. Um, and when you read the disability history in the country, they refer to the, the Fogarty hearings, at which Congressman Fogarty, in his role, he was a, a, a chair of one of the, the House Appropriations Committees invited every um, U.S. government entity in to talk about what they could do to support this, th this movement. Then what happened, essentially, is that as the parent movement grew, um, what they advocated for was a set of community services. So fundamentally, in Rhode Island between 1964, which is when the first was established, and 1978, which is when the last was um, uh, established, the, the parent movement really advocated for um, these family-driven centers. Some of you will remember, some of you will not, but between the mid-70s and the mid-80s, there were eight consecutive election cycles where there was a bond referenda that was approved typically about 70 to um, 30 percent to establish these centers and to provide support for them and for um, residential programs as well. What's significant, though, is that the focus was not on employment, because that's not where the country was. The focus was really on providing a place for them to go every day and then having something meaningful to do and this concept of enhancing their um, quality of life. Um, you know, and along the way, um, the self-advocacy movement, 
um, started. The first c convention of self-advocates was in Oregon in 1971, and the People First movement and People First language really kind of grew out of that. Um, the next thing, and I could read all of this list, but it's appropriate to understand that between 1960 and roughly 2000, there was a class action suit in virtually every state. And, and, and to recognize as well that there were a series of federal legislation that was passed, starting with the VR Act in 1954, the Funding for Community Centers Act was introduced by Congressman Fogarty in 1963, Next, down a whole bunch of stuff. The Medicaid waiver concept was really John Chafee's idea um, in 1981. And it ends, if you will, with the ADA. Um, it ends with the Olmstead decision that we just celebrated last year, the 15th um, um, anniversary of. And then even in the past year, we've had the Workforce Investment and Opp Opportunity Act that really does create um, avenues and opportunities for people with intellectual disabilities to be employed. And we also have the, the CMS setting rule that focuses on the fact that every service is supposed to occur in an integrated um, um, setting. In Rhode Island, we would refer to our own, cons our own class action suit uh, filed in 1976, consent reached in 1982. Um, and the last part, went, by the way, I was one of the monitors of this consent decree. Um, and the last person left led in 1994. Um, I just want a point I want to make is that in the old days, the old days still exist in some people's minds, people thought that disability was this organic thing that you had to somehow try to fix. The research of the last 50 years essentially says that what people become is, I mean, people with very significant, very complex disabilities can achieve significant things if we do a match between what their capabilities are and what the resources and supports and opportunities are. So the notion, there's one famous researcher who says that a person's level of disability is in direct relationship to the opportunities available and our willingness to take advantage of those, those opportunities. So then what happened? So I would tell you that about 2000, we were probably at our um, significant high point in this state. There were lots of people across the country who thought that we were perhaps the best system. Um, and then what started to happen over the next, over the last maybe 10 years or so, um, was that, that there was this sort of almost what one person has called a systematic deconstruction um, of the system that had been built over the previous 30 or 40 years. And I mean, and there were just some highlights here that relate to there, there was a, um, a loss of um, DD capacity in, in the, the state agency. There were budget cuts. Um, there was the unbundling of services that were bundled before that allowed for greater flexibility. And as a result of all of that, most of us are convinced that it's the collective impact of all of those things that resulted in justice coming to Rhode Island in 2013. Uh, just as one slide, just um, this comes from, there's a national publication that's based upon state data that comes out every year called the State of the States and DD. This was in the middle of that deconstruction period. They had this chart in their report for that year that showed the amount of change that every state went through. And the chart, the top three, you can see the, uh, there were three states that had some pretty significant in, in increases across the country. 31 states demonstrated increased spending. The average across all states was 3%. The bottom three on the list of 50 states was Idaho with an 11% decrease, Oklahoma with a 12% decrease, Rhode Island with a 13% decrease. So again, just the, the notion. So I think we got here, you understand the evolution of how we think about people, you understand how the systems change, and justice came. One of my roles is to be responsible for this thing called the Conversion Institute. This is the clause from the consent decree that says what the Conversion Institute is. The next slide says more or less what we're supposed to do, which is to provide um, technical assistance and support to the agencies, the facilities that are moving from a segregated entity to an integrated entity. Next slide. And so what we did, and I'm just going to focus on a couple of things. We did uh, 14 focus groups 
that included people with disabilities, families, um, direct support staff, leadership staff, several other people as well. And what we asked them essentially is to convert the system to do what the consent decree asked for, which is to move to increased employment and increased co um, community in integration, what is needed. And so what they said, just two, oh, um, f four really big needs. Um, one was the regulation reform. The people looked at virtually everybody felt that the regulatory structures they were lit were so restricting that they were unable to achieve the mission that they were there to do. The notion of, of doing systems redesign, recognizing that different people need different levels of support for different things, moving the system towards more integrated services, but also developing a model. Because when you recognize that there are roughly 3,800 people, um, 600 of whom are employed in an integrated setting part-time, 20% um, of whom are over 65, but that leaves essentially about 2,700 people in the, the middle who have very little to do every day. And so the notion about how do we develop a model um, that will allow all of those needs to be met in some way, shape, or form. Um, you know, just to highlight this as kind of the, we sometimes think everybody is 25, we sometimes think they're all, and what this documents is that there is, I mean, roughly 40% are 50 or older, and most of that 40% has really had very little experience um, with employment in integrated settings. So what it will take to move this population is really significant, but, and what it will take, to, we, there's a need to recognize the different kinds of needs that people have. Without belaboring the point, the, uh, and I'm not going to read these lists, but there were a um, significant number of need statements that grew out of those focus groups. I highlighted a few. Donna, just go back briefly one. The people felt there was not sufficient supports. People felt the system was not outcome driven. There's a real significant need to think about staffing in a very different way. Um, go ahead, Donna. Um, and, and one of the major crises in this state is um, the lack of stability of the direct support workforce. Go ahead, Donna. Um, so the other thing that the Conversion Institute and the Sherlock Center is involved with is doing an annual survey, which is probably, uh, not probably, is the most comprehensive survey in the country. We have about a 98% response rate. We can report very accurate data. We have refined that now to um, um, include all of the um, consent decree measures, um, and we're going to provide quarterly updates on that. And there's also this national research paradigm um, called the National Core Indicators, and we're doing an oversampling um, to really get a better sense of that as well. So. You know, just from without belaboring the point, we need a new model. This is a model for schools. Um, the research is really very clear that if that what correlates with post-school employment, if your family believes you can work and understands how the system works, you're five times more likely to be employed two, two years after school. If you know how to self-determine, which means you're able to set a goal and figure out how to get there, you are something like 400 times more likely to be employed. And if you've gone through a variety of experiences to build vocational interest and aptitude, you are, again, significantly more likely to be employed. So we're doing that model, by the way, with 31 school districts in the state. In the adult world, go back then, um, it's a similar kind of thing, but moving the world from programs to recognizing that CMS and the consent decree says that what we need to do is to design individual lives. So the whole concept about how do you design and implement, not 32 agency plans, but 3,800 into, into Vigil's life, figuring out it's the middle column, what they will do every day, but then the notion about you have to have the support system, you have to have a workforce that's able to do that. The, go ahead, Dan. The last two days, three days, we've had a workforce summit that DLT was here, was at, um, Buddha was at, all of the provider execs were at, parents were at, um, and the concept was to talk about how do you develop this workforce. And so just some of the, what, what we ha all know and what the research shows is that people in the direct support roles are the ones who really make change and their responsibilities have dramatically increased um, in the last 20 years. There was a response, uh, a survey, of 1,400 um, direct support um, staff responded, 40% work more than one job. The salary ranges are in the 9 to 10 to low 11 
dollar range. 70% report that their salaries do not cover their monthly expenses. More than a third receive assistance through some um, other state entity. And so the, t and the agency turnover rates are between 30 and 80%. So without a stable workforce, all of these things that the consent decree calls for are really not able to be achieved. Just two charts, very simply. Um, this is from the last version of the uh, um, Sherlock um, survey. You can, and these are the um, categories that are typically reported in national research. There has been the percentage of people working in integrated paid employment sets has stayed about the same. The percentage of people in facility-based employment, and that is the sheltered workshops, that has decreased. But what has increased are the number of people who are essentially doing nothing. Um, and what was only really thought of recently is how do we integrate in the aging world um, and begin to provide supports and services for the people who are over 65. The last chart, very, very simply, is that the other thing went in 20 years ago, 15 years ago, um, we thought of integrated employment as a group activity. There were these things called enclaves. What we have now discovered that an individual job is better than an enclave. And so this chart just documents that over the last five years, we have seen a movement away from enclaves, away from group employment into individual employment. So I think if you think about all of that, the history, the system evolved, how we thought about people with disabilities evolved, um, the Conversion Institute is set up to try to make change, and there are some really pretty significant needs. The last thing, you do have a, a, a page and a half handout. Um, that is sort of a summary of what I just said, and now I will turn it over to Dr. Mosley. Oh, before we do that, we have a short video that we were going to show. That's that that access to uh, one of my customers. He actually happens to spearhead Access Point Rhode Island. Uh, we talked for a while about trying to get some people over. Arena happened to be one of the ones she selected, and she came over and did her internship for us for about a year, which was excellent. So um, there we have it. For a year, she did the program wonderful the entire time. Um, looked to employ her at some point when it came uh, became possible, and um, there we have it. I hired her. Um, she's been employed with me ever since February, and it's been terrific. And then you move on to the next section. CBS, the manager Sherman, uh, could evaluate Arena and see that she would make a really good employee and that her skills were well suited to the position. I'm a firm believer in trying to give an individual an opportunity uh, to succeed, uh, the opportunity to get into the workforce, to get work ready, so we call it, so that if they don't reside here, they can make a home somewhere else, and we try to give them the utilities and the tools to go out and, and make that happen. And through the internship, it went on for about a year, about two hours a week. I really became really comfortable with potential co-workers, with customers, as well as with the layout of the store and the requirements of being a customer service rep for CBS. Irene is always excited. You know, when she comes in, she's eager, ready to go. Um, some of my younger employees see it, and you know what? It reflects in what they do during the course of the day because they look at her and say, wow, like she's here for a few hours, and she's running around. She's really diligent in what she's trying to do, and you know what? It kind of inspires them to do the same thing. So very, very impactful in having her on the team. Sherman talked about uh, Irene's ability as a role model for other employees at CVS. Primary goal uh, for the people who supported Access Point is to help them to become full, engaged members of their community. Uh, in order for that to happen, opportunities have to be presented from us, but also by the community. That opportunity can be there for so many other people as long as we work together, because it is about the community as well as about the people. With the help that she gets uh, from Access Point Rhode Island, um, it's very easy to, you know, it was very easy for her to assimilate to the team. Um, not hard at all to get her through, you know, the program itself. It gives us the opportunity to hire, to hire her right away. Um, I made one phone call, took about maybe seven days. It takes less time to hire someone that's already in a program that's affiliated with your company rather than trying to outsource and try to get someone to come in. So very easy. 
easy to bring someone like that into your um, establishment. So um, I would definitely recommend it to anyone that's looking to try to bring people in. That's going to give them um, the results they need to get. And that's the big thing. You know, you want to place people where they're comfortable with the management staff and team that's going to, you know, embrace them and give them an opportunity to succeed somewhere else. So, big thing. I do all days, and I do I do the security tax. Well, thank, thank you. Thank you for being part of this presentation. You're welcome. It really helped us. Thank you. You're welcome. It's been an inspiration. Thank you. Thanks very much. That, that really shows better than anyone can say exactly what the purpose uh, and the outcomes, the anticipated outcomes of the consent decree are. So what I wanted to do was give a, a concise guide to the consent decree. I know you'd love to stay here probably for several hours getting into the, the minutia of it, um, but I wanted to do, provide an overview of what it is, um, the key goals that are hoped to be achieved, that are planned to be achieved through the implementation of the consent decree, uh, and some of the various components of it. Um, it begins really uh, back to uh, the uh, Americans with Disabilities Act in 1999, which was enacted to provide a clear and comprehensive national man ma uh, mandate for the elimination of discrimination against individuals with disabilities. Uh, in 1999, uh, the Olmstead ruling of the Supreme Court uh, instituted the in integration mandate, which really um, said that the delivery of public services resulting in the unnecessary segregation of individuals in a wide variety of residential and non-residential settings, including segregated employment, uh, vocational and day programs, is a violation of individuals' rights and constitutes discrimination uh, under the Americans with Disabilities Act. This was an incredibly powerful message that came from the Supreme Court back in 1999. Because although, as Tony described, states really across the nation were working to remove the number of people in institutions, um, especially after uh, the, the late 1960s, early 1970s, when there were several exposés of uh, uh, the, the problems with institutions, it, the, the movement never really had gotten to the point where individuals with disabilities who had uh, really no reason to be segregated away from society were given a um, specific right um, to receive those supports in the most integrated setting um, appropriate to their needs. In 2013, an investigation by the Department of Justice's Civil Rights uh, Division uh, found that Rhode Island had violated the Americans with Disabilities Act and the Supreme Court ruling by failing to serve individuals with intellectual and developmental disabilities in the most integrated uh, day activity settings uh, appropriate to their needs. And the day activity settings addressed very specifically employment um, and integrated day programs. As you all know, people were basically receiving the supports uh, that they needed throughout the day in sheltered workshops and uh, in the, excuse me, segregated day programs. Second point was placing transition age uh, youth at serious risk of segregation as they move into the adult system. Uh, as many of you know, when kids are coming out of special ed and moving into adult systems, uh, in several states, for example, there's not a clear pathway for them to move directly into employment or directly into uh, services and supports that will enable them to access employment at another date. Uh, the, the pattern that was existing in Rhode Island was from one um, center-based program at school to a center-based program uh, throughout adult life. And as many of you know, um, the, the long-term system for people with intellectual and developmental disabilities is truly long-term. 
the aging population talk a lot about long-term care, but the average length of time that someone stays in long-term care who is aging is between 18 and 24 months. Uh, people who come into the developmental disability system tend to come in after school or even before school, depending on the state, and stay with the service delivery system for the rest of their lives. So we're really looking at a long-term uh, investment in people's lives. And the consent decree um, has sort of an underlying purpose, uh, which says that if, you, if public services are going to um, support people uh, with challenging needs throughout their lives, and it makes sense to invest in the services and supports that will enable those people to contribute to society, enable those people to give back and to work and to have a meaningful life. The findings noted that in spite of the state's significant commitment to ensure people can live in integrated settings, thousands of individuals sp still spend the majority of their daytime in segregated workshops and facility-based programs uh, although they are capable to receive employment and day services in the community. Rhode Island was one of the real leaders in closing the LAD school, closing its institutional program, the third state. The first was New Hampshire, the second Vermont, the third uh, Rhode Island, quick on its heels, um, and several other states. And about 13 to 14 states across the country have really gotten out of the institution business. But the next step of really coming up with services and supports that enable people to fully engage in community life has been much more challenging. The um, uh, investigations of the Department of Justice resulted in two separate agreements. One is the interim settlement agreement, uh, which focused on violations by the state and the city of Providence uh, with respect to the unnecessary uh, segregation of individuals in two programs, training through placement and the Birch Vocational Program. And what I'd like to talk about today is the consent decree, which is much broader and really focuses on violations with respect to uh, Rhode Island's statewide day activity system and the over-reliance on segregated models. I've highlighted a couple of the findings and a couple of the remedies here, so you can kind of see how it's structured. The finding, the over-reliance on segregated models. The Department of Justice in their investigation found that 80 percent, approximately 2,700 people with intellectual and developmental disabilities were being served in segregated programs and workshops, while only 12 percent, only 385 individuals, were in individualized, integrated, supported employment. Workshop placements were long-term. 46 percent of the people who went in did not leave within 10 years, and 34 percent did not uh, leave within 15 years. Average rates of pay were low, $2.21 per hour. So the, re the remedy was really a 10-year sustained effort, and that's what um, is set up by the structure of the consent decree, to provide relief to 3,200 people with intellectual and developmental disabilities receiving public state-funded services. This includes supported employment placements to about 2,000 people, 700 individuals from uh, sheltered workshops, about 950 from facility-based day programs, and 300 to 350 students who are really in the process of transitioning to school. Again, unnecessary segregation between 2010 and 2012, only 5 percent of youth with intellectual and developmental disabilities tra were transitioning, who transitioned from school entered integrated employment settings, only 5 percent. And if you look at some of the data um, that uh, research has done on parents and families and individuals who are in the transition process, what their expectations are when they move to adult life, the vast majority um, really expect to work in a community setting, regardless of which state they're living in. The remedy was to change state policy and practice, provide transition services to 1,200 individuals with IDD between the ages of 14 and 21, uh, RIDE will adopt and implement an employment first policy for youth in, uh, in transition, follow a school to work transition planning model with benchmarks and timelines, and provide integrated vocational and situational assessment and tri trial work experiences to enable people to really understand what work is like in the community. When a person with disabilities is receiving services in a segregated model for over a long period of time, and someone knocks on the door and comes in and says, say, would you like to work in this business down the street? Folks 
like like any of us, say no. I'm happy where I am. I know where I am. I know what kind of services and supports I can expect. So part of the whole process is to move people out into uh, situational assessments and give people trial work experiences so that they and their families can really begin to understand how life can be different. The consent decree um, identifies specific action that the state agreed to take to resolve the Department of Justice's findings of violations. Individuals with IDD and sheltered workshops who have been served in, oh, I'm sorry, what I have here, the, the, there are three groups that have been targeted for support. There's actually four target groups. The, the folks in transition are really in the, the same group. So the first group is individuals who are in sheltered workshops or who have been in sheltered workshops over the past year. The second is individuals with IDD who are in facility-based day programs. And the third are youth with intellectual disabilities who are transitioning from secondary schools to adult services. The consent decree has a number of uh, different provisions. I've kind of identified 13 major operational provisions, but each one of those has several moving parts within it, so it, it creates a, a, a lot more. Um, I've highlighted some of the, the more important ones, but as you can see, it really uh, addresses a whole series of different uh, operational components that must be addressed if you're going to give someone the support they need to really take part in community, to access community activities, to access employment, to the same extent that a person without disabilities would be able to access those services. Funding for services is one of the, the key pieces um, and provides kind of the floor of the agreement because the dollars really need to be there to enable the service delivery system that has been based on segregated settings to make the shift that it needs to make to support people in a new way in a different place. Integrated supported employment placement targets. The consent decree identifies a number of individuals, a specific number, that needs to be placed from sheltered, the work, sheltered workshop population at different intervals over the course of the, of the, uh, of the year. Uh, similarly, with integrated day services, a number of individuals is identified that need to be placed in integrated day services as the system moves forward. People in transition age youth, uh, several provisions specifically address the, the nature of the services, services that need to be provided to youth in transition. Person-centered career development planning. Um, the, the, this is highlighted because the person-centered career development plan forms one of the key components of the process of moving, of changing the system, of moving things forward. In the past, services and supports were organized um, in large institutions, basically with a one-size-fits-all model. Uh, services were designed around the needs for the majority of individuals, and for those people who had fewer, uh, fewer or greater needs, they kind of had to muddle through. It became pretty clear as people began to work with individuals with developmental disability and understand the potential that they have that services need to be designed around the strengths and needs of each individual person. It's a more cost-effective way of doing business, and it also allows the service delivery system, the staff, uh, and the providers, uh, and the, the family members who work with individuals to target their activities uh, in the areas that will do the most good. Benefits planning. You all know that we have a very complicated uh, disability uh, funding system uh, uh, excuse me, a very co a complicated system for people with disabilities who are working uh, and whose ability to work uh, is compromised by um, some of the needs that they might have in the health area, some of their uh, the problems that they might have. So benefits planning is really key to take away the fear that family members might have that, oh, gee, if my son goes to work and starts earning a paycheck, the SSI check that comes into our family um, is no longer going to be there. We won't get that SSI, and we de uh, really depend on that SSI for support. So at one level you think, well, should a family depend on the SSI for support? But most people with developmental disabilities live in the home of a family member. Most people who receive state services, over about 57% of people who receive public funded services, live in the home of a family member. Those family members are there 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and it's very important to maximize their ability to continue to support people over the long haul. 
Training is identified as a key area, uh, outreach, education, and support. Provider capacity, you cannot move forward with the consent decree goals, uh, outcomes, uh, and achieve the, the outcomes in the consent decree without a strong investment in the workforce that's going to provide those very personal, very detailed, and very technical supports that people need to have as they move uh, into society. Interagency collaboration is is uh, is critical. States are really good, state departments and state agencies are really good at not getting along with each other, and the consent decree identifies that as um, a key goal that needs to be accomplished. Uh, consistent definitions, I'm going to jump over quality improvement first. Um, as a part of the consent decree, that it provides a whole series of different definitions for all state agencies to use to try to keep people on the same, in the same ballpark. Quality improvement is a critical component of the consent decree, as well as, and probably most importantly, data collection and monitoring. I think the state is really lucky in having the um, uh, long-term uh, data gathering uh, capacity that exists at the Sherlock Center. Uh, as Tony mentioned, so you have some of the best data on employment, and as uh, I've been working with you all to really implement the consent decree, it became pretty clear that you don't need to um, reinvent the wheel. What really uh, needs to happen is that, that the state needs to embrace the um, uh, current uh, activities that are taking place in the area of data collection and expand it to meet some of the uh, consent decree guidelines. And that step has taken, and I really applaud the state for moving in that direction. The consent decree, some additional provisions, people receiving supports, uh, supported employment must receive an employer paid wages at minimum wage or greater. No sub-minimum wages are allowed. Work a maximum hour consistent with the person's abilities and preferences. It's not enough to go in to say, to say well, you're going to work two hours a day, five days a week, like it or lump it. It really needs to be based on that person-centered career development plan that I spoke about. Have opportunities to interact with non-disabled co-workers to the fullest extent possible. The Olmstead ruling makes it very clear that people with disabilities have a right to access all of the major components of society to the same extent as people without disabilities. As a group, they're expected to average work uh, of 20 hours per week. Um, many states are not at that level. Some states, Washington State is a good example, um, is pretty close to that level. Uh, and be provided with integrated non-work services during the times when the individual is not working based on a standard hour per week. Work is, um, a, is a terrific goal and it's very appropriate to focus on. But what people do when they're not working is also an extremely important goal. And lining people up with community activities and helping them uh, get the support they need to truly become a participant in uh, local uh, YMCA's or local civic activities is a challenge. It, it, frankly, it's a challenge for all of us, I, I think, to get involved with other people at a, at a social level, but this is a key part of the consent decree. Outreach education and support, developing an outreach, inreach education program uh, to explain supported employment benefits to families and address any concerns that they might have about the impact of working. Uh, create an employment first task force of shareholders, advocates, business leadership networks, individuals with disabilities and their families to provide input on the changes that are taking place um, and to assist um, BHDDH and ORS and RIDE in understanding the impact of the decisions that might be made with respect to policy and practice on the people who receive those services. Create a sheltered workshop conversion institute, conversion tr trust fund, and bring in contractors to provide technical assistance. And I think Tony talked about the conversion institute and um, those other uh, pieces of the, the consent decree as well. One of the key points of the consent decree is that people with expertise need to be involved in the process so that the state can really make decisions based on the best information available. Um, st the state will develop interagency agreements among state agencies, BHDDH, ORS, and RIDE, and I was delighted to see that the Memorandum of Understanding was signed last month, I believe. 
um, between uh, the three departments. There's another agreement that's uh, in process, I understand, the data sharing agreement, to make it really clear that information can be shared so that when the people are moving out of the school system, the schools, RIDE, can talk to BHDDH and ORS and say, these folks are going to need your support in the years ahead so that when you build your budget, you need to know that there are whatever 70-some um, people coming out of special education that are going to need uh, the level of support that's furnished by public services. Develop ba, 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 allocation of responsibility, data coordination, and uh, of outreach efforts. Um, ensure that individual funding is necessary. No, excuse me. Ensure, ensure that each individual has the funding necessary to access supported employment and integrated services. This is a requirement on the state. People need to be assured they have the funding necessary to purchase the services they need to work in integrated settings. Funding also must be provided to ensure that people receive the supports they need to become fully integrated in the community during the time that they're not working. Now, those are two very key pieces because they have financial ramifications. Ensure that the funding methodology for day activity services, and this is basically employment and integrated day services, provides adequate uh, resources to pay for transportation, to pay for the time that it takes for a staff member to negotiate with an employer, uh, a, a local business, um, to, to get a job, to pay for counseling, people by phone, and other non-face-to-face -face supports uh, around supported employment activities. Now, in several states, what's happened is that the billing structure has been put into place uh, in such a way that only face-to-face -face interaction can be paid for. Well, as you all know, when you're finding a job, Many of us have relied, relied on family members or good friends to make those calls to other people when, when you're not in a room to say, I know Jack, he's a really good person, and you should think about hiring this guy. Those kinds of activities need to be covered as well because, frankly, those are the kinds of activities um, through which most people find jobs. The next slide. I thought you might be interested in some comparative costs. So I talked to my friends at the uh, University of Massachusetts, Boston, who operate the State Employment Leadership Network. They're working with 25 states across the country, 25 or 27, who have come forward and, and actually purchased uh, this long-term technical assistance service to improve their ability to support people in, in employment situations. They run data um, each year on the costs and outcomes of services, uh, employment services for people with disabilities. Rhode Island all-day all service, and this is mean cost per person. So this is average cost of services per person. Rhode Island is $12,506 for day services per year, $1,131 uh, excuse me, $1,131 for employment services. Massachusetts uh, didn't report their day services. They, they have a whole lot of things kind of funneled together, and they can't tease out just the day services. But for integrated employment, they do uh, track those dollars, 7,772. Connecticut, 21.6 for uh, integrated day services, excuse me, all day services, uh, and 15,811 for employment. Um, Maine didn't report. Uh, New Hampshire, 21,000 for day services and 19,000, almost 20,000 a year for supported employment services. In Vermont, 13,151 for day services and 9,814 for employment service. So it's pretty clear that the investment that Rhode Island is making in, in uh, enabling people, providing the supports and services to individuals so that they can become employed is much lower um, than the, the New England region. I wanted to look at the, the cost nationwide, and you have kind of a range. The low uh, for day services is 4,000. Dollars four thousand two seventy three in Texas. Um, the low for integrated employment is Mississippi at three hundred and twenty four dollars a year, which ain't much. Um, the average is twelve thousand three hundred eight for day services, around six thousand for employment services. That's nationwide. The high um, is twenty four seven eighty seven in Alaska and New York, and for employment, the nineteen thousand nine seventy seven. So. Um, it kind of puts into perspective the costs uh, of the services to provide uh, adequate services and supports uh, to individuals with intellectual and developmental disabilities. Thank you. 
additional required actions um, are quality improvement. Um, the quality improvement section of the consent decree is an incredibly important <coughs> section. Um, that is the means, uh, having an effective, uh, active quality insurance, uh, excuse me, quality improvement program is going to provide the means for the state to track the outcomes that it's receiving for the money that it's, it's, it's investing. Now, the data that's coming out of the Sherlock Center is very good and will be an important piece to determine quality, but the quality, five minutes, okay, the quality uh, improvement program really needs to cover uh, several key areas. Transition planning, career development planning, benefits, supported employment, one that establishes program standards as the criteria against which services are going to be measured. An improvement program that is designed to regularly conduct on-site reviews to evaluate services, to write up reports indicating the strengths and the weaknesses, and to come up with, in, in concert with provider agencies, to come up with a plan of correction to remediate those strengths and improve services over the long haul. Published reports identifying findings and recommendations. Uh, data collection and monitoring, um, I'm going to kind of speed through this a little bit. Um, regulate, the state must regularly collect, aggregate, and analyze data on about 44 data points across the service delivery system. Documenting necessary actions, using that data to identify barriers, recommending um, steps to take to remove those barriers, and on a regular basis, the state should be, each department should be looking at those data to determine um, that things are going in the right direction. Some states who have, are engaged in this are publishing the data so that providers can really see how they're stacking up. And if one provider is not meeting their placement goals, then, then people need to know about that. Uh, all, the Olmstead mandate uh, and system changers, settle, a very similar settlement uh, agreement in Oregon focusing on employment. Uh, Virginia has a broad settlement agreement uh, from the, its interaction with the Department of Justice that looks at both institutional programs and employment programs, but many of the components are similar. The federal uh, agency, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, um, a couple of years ago published the Home and Community-Based Services Regulation that are based on the key tenets of the Olmstead um, ruling. Basically, they're designed now to ensure that funding and services, um, that funding is targeted to integrated services and supports for folks with uh, developmental and, uh, disabilities. And each state, you folks are, I know are engaged in this as well, each state is coming up with a transition plan uh, to document how it's going to implement these guidelines from the federal government around home and community-based uh, services. The, the, uh, the goals, the specific components, really line up very clearly between the consent decree and the, the federal regulations that were being implemented. Oh, my goodness, I have final thoughts. Um, consent decree details the specific actions that the state agreed to take over a 10-year period um, to enable people to access employment supports across departments. The goals and objectives and performance benchmarks provide an incremental roadmap for change. They really do. Um, it's the design of the consent decree is is good. I mean, it's solid in terms of moving a state forward. The goals and objectives can be met within the set time frames if key actions and systems change activities are completed in the early years, and I mean right now. Um, a, there's a 10-year span, but if the investments are not made in the foundation years right now, the, goal, the outcome numbers, the placement numbers that need to be met in the out years uh, won't be met. Um, let's see. The challenges in developing and implementing effective strategies for systems change um, are, uh, they lie in really coming up with an effective plan to move forward in each of the state agencies affected. And I think that's it. I don't know if anyone has any questions. Questions? Yes. Oh. Um, so at any point in the 10-year plan going forward, um, do you envision we will reach a point where um, the decree will require minimum funding? Um, and will that minimum funding, is, would the goal of that minimum funding be to um, grow provider capacity to the quality and the 
and the minimum requirements that are envisioned within the consent decree? Well, the, the consent decree really requires minimum funding now to, yep. to address all of the, the specific um, identified outcomes. Um, right now, the state is, I think, working hard to make adjustments to the system to move from a model that uh, was basically a maintenance model in the past to one that is really designed to provide uh, training, individual support, um, designed to establish a community infrastructure so that 30 years down the road, a lot of the decisions, uh, decisions won't need to be made about whether we should develop, whether you should develop um, a specialized program to do A, B, C, and D. So um, the, the minimum funding um, really, I, I think, um, it rests on uh, the nature of the um, systems change activities that have to be engaged in during each of the years uh, of the consent decree. Um, for example, the, um, the most recent um, report, I need to do reports every several months talking about the, the progress the state is making, and one of the areas that uh, appeared to me that really needed to be addressed um, was the uh, staffing resources of BHDDH. I'll be real specific. Um, BHDDH has the heavy lift. I mean, people are with BHDDH their entire lives. Uh, VR provides, uh, ORS provides some, some targeted training to get people up and working. Um, but then if they, as they go on with their lives, uh, ORS, or DD really needs to carry it. Um, there was no uh, person to coordinate employment services, for example. Uh, between the providers and the state. Um, most states have that, that position uh, because of the importance of employment. So I identified the need for a person to coordinate employment services. I also identified the need for an individual to uh, uh, coordinate the development of a, um, a quality assurance plan and also an individual to really manage the changes that the department is going through. Um, these are th these big system change um, goals and requirements are, are not small, they're large, and they really involve uh, a comprehensive review of, of funding, um, staffing resources, management, um, the development of effective strategic plans to address the overall process of systems change, as well as the discrete activities that need to take place in quality, for example, um, in, in changing your funding system. So um, I, I think uh, the, although the, the consent decree doesn't say you must have a plan that does A, B, and C, and D, um, it's pretty hard to envision accomplishing those goals without such a plan. Does the plan also say you must reach these goals by a certain date? Yes, there are dates certain um, where uh, certain activities need to take place. Uh, for example, a, um, uh, a comprehensive a person-centered career development planning system needs to be in place um, a year ago. Uh, there are certain uh, placement targets. 50 individuals need to be placed by a certain date. Another 50 need to be placed by another date, another 50. So there are, are several uh, tiered um, requirements around individual placements. So has the state met those goals? Not state? all of them, no. no. Um, there are... Um, uh, several activities that, that need to take place. Um, the, uh, to be fair, uh, the consent decree really contemplated everything starting on day one. So, you know, by day two, you're going to have this done. Well, things do take some time. And uh, in my role as monitor, I certainly can understand that, uh, that time needs to be spent to, um, to develop certain parts of the, of the uh, service delivery system, the career development planning process or something like that. Um, but you can do that for only so long. So um, there are very clear goals, they're time specific and actions need to be taken to ensure that people are, are, are meeting those goals. Um, to answer your question, the state has not met several of them. Um, when we uh, had a status hearing uh, before the, the judge in uh, uh, January, we talked about the specific areas that uh, needed to be addressed, and we'll be continuing to, to look at that going forward. Other questions? Thank you. Thank you.
Um, we do have a little time. I know we said there will be no public comment, uh, but the bell hasn't rung and it's 4 o'clock. Um, is there anybody? I know there are several um, providers present and some department people present. Anybody interested in um, adding a statement to the presentation before we adjourn? If not, we'll adjourn until the bell. Thank you very much.